evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's IAI event on designer babies. Nazi talk of a master race and the atrocities that it spawned have led us to be appalled by the idea of eugenics and its proposed manipulation of human reproduction to improve the species. Yet, 83% of women have prenatal tests for abnormalities, including Down syndrome. And if diagnosed, the great majority then choose to have terminations. Meanwhile, sperm banks allow the selection of characteristics that include height, eye colour, ethnicity and intelligence. Are we hypocritical to condemn past figures such as Churchill for sympathising with eugenics while applying eugenic principles in our personal lives? Should we regulate prenatal tests, terminations and sperm banks more tightly? Or should we extend further our ability to precisely determine the character of our children? And I'd now like to introduce our four fantastic panellists who are going to speak on these issues. First of all, we have Becky Bennett, Professor in Bioethics at the University of Manchester. With almost 30 years of experience in teaching bioethics, Becky has published on a wide range of issues, but has special interest in the ethics of screening for Down syndrome. Jacob Appel, is a bioethicist, author, poet, psychiatrist, and social critic. With seven master's degrees, 10 plays, and 19 books, Jacob remains proud of the 21,000 rejection letters he has received over the years. Simon Baron Cohen is a cognitive neuroscientist and the director of Cambridge's Autum Autism Research Center, who has argued that autism involves a disability in empathy alongside strengths in pattern recognition. His research has explored the prenatal biology of autism. And finally, we have Kari Stephenson, who is the founder and CEO of Decode Genetics, a company that controversially used the medical records of the Icelandic Health Service to create a database of the public's medical, genetic and genealogical data, pioneering use of population scale genetics to further understanding of variation in the human genome. Are we inadvertently sliding towards eugenics? So, Becky, would you like to start us off? Well, traditional eugenics involves the overriding of reproductive choices of individuals. And it's usually based on one powerful group's notion of the ideal society. Overriding individuals' choices is problematic if we want to live in a society that values the ability to run our own lives. And overriding these choices based on the subjective or unsubstantiated views of what is considered to be the, the best human being is even more difficult to justify. Eugenic policy sends a powerful, unjustified, negative message about certain groups in society. But it's not clear that all the things we're going to talk about this evening can be compared to, to this kind of ethically offensive eugenics. Some of the things we're talking about here are simply about allowing individuals the freedom to make reproductive choices. However, once there's pressure to choose in a particular way, then we move towards many of the negative connotations of traditional eugenics. Let's take, for example, routine screening for Down syndrome. Having a diagnostic test for Down syndrome in pregnancy is not ethically problematic in itself. There are all sorts of reasons why people will want to know if the fetus they are carrying has the condition. The problem comes in the way that this test is offered. By making this part of routine screening and making it part of a routine screening program, we send a message that having this screening test is a good idea and we send a negative message about living with Down syndrome. This puts pressure on people not only to accept the test, but also about what's considered to be the right choice after receiving a positive test result. Before we consider these questions further, there's also another very important distinction to make. Some of the choices we will make will affect the welfare of the, of the same person and other decisions will affect who will be born. Unlike same person choices, preventing the birth of a child with a condition seen as disabling does not improve this child's welfare. They can either be born with this condition or not be born at all. 
what it does mean is that somebody else will be born instead. And for me, this is a really important distinction when it comes to the ethics of these issues. So given that identifying what is the best life is impossible, we should try and enable individuals to have as free a reproductive choice as is possible based on balanced, unbiased information. Allowing the state to override or even influence the reproductive choices of individuals is not justified and actually does the opposite of creating the sort of society we wish to live in. It creates a world where only the choices that the powerful agree with are upheld. Thank you for sharing your thoughts on this theme. So I'd like to pass to Jacob, please. Thank you. So my sense is that everyone on the Zoom call wants to make the world a better place. We just have different senses of how to do it. As a libertarian myself, I think there's been much too much emphasis on the libertarian aspects of the debate surrounding designer babies, because then you get concerned of the world drifting towards something. What I'd like to do is emphasize a few points about the communitarian and egalitarian benefits of designing babies that may make an argument for running toward it rather than being concerned that we're drifting toward it. First, designer babies hold the promise of making the world better, even for those who eschew the practice. Imagine if rather than a Newton or an Einstein every century, we had many of them in every generation. How many diseases might be cured with this knowledge? How many insoluble scientific or social problems might we fix? However much Shakespeare or Edison might benefit from their own accomplishments, the rest of us benefit too. And in that sense, a rising tide raises all ships. Second, designer babies hold the promise of creating a more equitable society. This may seem counterintuitive to a lot of people, but at present, we already grant considerable advantage to those who are well healed. Um, if you can hire an academic tutor, you can get into a fancy university. If you can hire a tennis coach for your kids, they can play at Wimbledon. Um, and that compounds underlying biological injustices. My sense is that everyone on this call has a rather significant gift of intelligence. Um, having worked with patients whose IQs are in the 75 to 80 range, the world is much harder for them. We should make it easier, but that's also a significant burden to bear. If we lived in a remotely equitable world, or there were any promise of us reaching that point sometime soon, there might be a compelling argument for limiting these sorts of reproductive interventions, but we don't. And with that in mind, designer babies may be the best opportunity we have to create this equality. They might be the great equalizer. So my goal with the underlying premise that these are inevitable, if you look at what happened in China with germline editing, eventually somebody will begin designing babies in the way that I am talking about, we want to make sure that resources are devoted to making everyone have an equal opportunity and to making sure that the people who don't avail themselves of this opportunity have their rights protected. Thanks. Thank you, Jacob. Yes, a very compelling argument there. So, um, uh, Simon, would you like to share your thoughts on this theme? Um, so I want to pick up on, on Becky's um, topic of, of Down syndrome and just to register my concern about Jacob's argument, but we'll come back to that. Um, so if we think about the screening for Down syndrome, um, the test that was widely used for most of the last century was amniocentesis. And it, it actually goes back to the 1930s. But by the time amniocentesis could be done with ultrasound, so that you could guide the needle uh, into the womb um, in about the 1970s, it then became widespread practice. And, you know, from the 1980s onwards, it's been offered as a test for Down syndrome. I'm not aware that there was a national or an international debate on the ethics of introducing this technology in terms of what are we doing to our population? Um, I'm sure Carrie is going to pick this up after me. But in Iceland, where he's from, the uh, uptake of amniocentesis is near universal. So the result in Iceland is that 99% of people with Down syndrome who would have lived were terminated or prevented from living, meaning that there are only one or two people with Down syndrome who were born every year in the whole country. So the question, are we inadvertently sliding towards 
eugenics. I think it's already happened. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.